In this video, we're going to be talking about simple comparative experiments. This will cover sections 2.3 and 2.4 from our book. So, experiments. An experiment is a study in which one or more explanatory variables are manipulated in order to observe the effect on a response variable. A response variable is a variable that is not controlled by the experimenter and that is measured as part of the experiment. So let's look at this example. Suppose we are interested in determining the effect of room temperature on the performance on a first semester calculus exam. So we decide to perform an experiment. What variable will we measure? What do you think? will measure the performance on the calculus exam. So this is our response variable. Let's talk about explanatory variables. Explanatory variables are those variables that have values that are controlled by the experimenter. These are also called factors. So Suppose we are interested in determining the effect of the room temperature on the performance on a first semester calculus exam, so we decide to perform an experiment. What variable will explain the results on the calculus exam? Think about it. For our experiment, what variable will explain the results on the calculus exam? the room temperature. What's an experimental condition? It's any particular combination of the explanatory variables. We also call these treatments. So, for example, we decide to use two temperature settings, 65 degrees and 75 degrees. So how many treatments would our experiment have? The two treatments are the two temperature settings. So if we decided to use three temperature settings, let's say 65 degrees, 75 degrees, and 85 degrees, then we would have three treatments because there would be three temperature settings. Let's continue with this room temperature experiment, okay? Random assignment of subjects is, well, sorry. Random assignment of subjects to treatments or treatments to trials ensures that the experiment does not systematically favor one treatment over another. Okay, that's random assignment. So suppose we have 10 sections of first semester calculus that have agreed to participate in our study. On who or what will we impose the treatments? Who are we going to do the experiment to? We're going to do it to the 10 sections of calculus. These are what we call our subjects or our experimental units. It's the smallest unit to which a treatment can be applied. So how would we determine which sections would be in rooms with the temperature set at 65 degrees, and which sections in rooms is set at 75 degrees. For this, we need to randomly assign them to the treatments. So to randomly assign the 10 sections of first semester calculus to the two treatment groups, we would first number the classes one through 10. Then, place all the numbers 1 through 10 on identical slips of paper and put them in a half. Shake it up, mix it up, makes it real, real, real good, right? Then we're going to randomly select five numbers from the hat. And these are going to be the sections that have the room temperature set at 65 degrees. So let's shake our hat. We're going to shake our hat and we reach it and we're going to get the number 9. So that's going to be our first section that has a room temperature of 65 degrees. And then we get seven, then five, 
and then eight, and then three. So here are our five sections. So the remaining sections will have room temperature set to 75 degrees. So sections one, two, four, six, and 10. Let's talk about replication. Replication ensures that there is an adequate number of observations for each experimental condition. Okay, so notice that there are five sections assigned to each of the treatments. This is replication. Why is replication an important trait of a well-designed experiment? Well, replication is important so that we can account for the natural variation that occurs within the experimental units. So sticking with our experiment, so remember, the explanatory variable is the room temperature settings, 65 degrees and 75 degrees, and the response variable is the rate on the calculus exam. So the question is, are there other variables that could affect that response? Think about that for a moment. What kinds of things did you think of? Did you think of the time of day that this section is occurring? What about the instructor? Sometimes that makes a big difference. How about the textbook being used? What about the different abilities of the students? These are variables that we call extraneous variables. So an extraneous variable is a variable that is not one of the explanatory variables. It's not one of our factors, but it is thought to affect the response. So the question is, can somebody conducting the experiment, the experimenter, can they control these extraneous variables? And if so, how? In an experiment, these extraneous variables, they need to be controlled. So there's something called direct control. And direct control is holding the extraneous variables constant so that their effects are not confounded with those of the experimental conditions. They're not confounded with those of the treatments. Now remember, two variables are confounding if their effects on the response cannot be distinguished from each other. So which of the extraneous variables in the room temperature can be controlled? Instructor, the time of day, the textbook, the ability of the student. Is it feasible to be able to control each of these extraneous variables? What about the variables that the experimenter can't directly control? What can be done to avoid confounding results? One way is blocking. Blocking is a process by which an extraneous variable's effects are filtered out. So you have similar groups, and it's called blocks and create them. Then all treatments are tried in each block. So what does that mean? Let's look at it in the form of our experiment. Suppose there were five instructors who taught the first semester calculus. Now we don't have direct control over this variable. However, we could have each instructor teach two sections. Then we could randomly assign which one of the two sections would have a temperature setting of 65 and the other would have a temperature setting of 75. So what about extraneous variables that we can't control directly or that we can't block for 
or that we don't even think about, that's where random assignment is going to come in. This ensures that the experiment does not systematically favor one experimental condition treat or treatment over another. Okay, does not systematically favor one treatment over another. So you should evenly spread all of the extraneous variables that are not controlled directly or they're not blocked into all treatment groups. We expect these variables to affect all the experimental groups in the same way. Therefore, their effects are not confounding. Now, an experiment in which the subjects do not know which treatment they are, they're in is called a single blind experiment. So they don't know what they're in. Now, a double blind experiment is one in which the subjects or the individuals who are being measured and the people who are doing the measuring do not know which treatment is being received. So think about it. Would the students in each section of calculus know to which treatment group, either 65 degrees or 75 degrees, they were assigned? I mean, those are some pretty big temperature differences. So if the students knew about the experiment, they'd probably know which treatment group they were in. So this experiment is probably not blinded because they know what they're in. control group is an experimental group that does not receive any treatment. So in the room temperature experiment, we only have two temper like two treatments, right? Two temperatures, 65 degrees and 75 degrees. So we do not have a control group. Okay. Now a control group allows the experimenter to access, not access, assess how the response variable behaves when the treatment is not used. This provides a baseline against which the treatment groups can be compared to determine whether the treatment had an effect or whether it didn't. So let's look at a different example to kind of explain this. Consider Anna. Anna is a waitress and she decides to perform an experiment to decide if writing thank you on the receipt increases her tip percentage. So she plans on having two groups. On one group, she will write thank you on the receipt. And on the other group, she will not write thank you on the receipt. Which of these is the control group? Our control group is those where she will not write thank you on the receipt because she's trying to determine if writing thank you on the receipt will increase her tip. So the control group is a group where she will not write thank you. Now suppose we want to test an herbal supplement to determine if it aided in weight loss. Why would it not be beneficial having two groups in the experiment? One that takes the supplement and a control group that takes nothing. Well, with the control group, people may respond to the treatment simply because they think it is supposed to aid in weight loss. How about the power of suggestion? So what can we do to remedy this problem? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to give one group the supplement and give the other group a pill that is the same size, same color, same taste, same smell as the supplement, but it contains no active ingredient. This pill, this 
thing that doesn't have the active ingredient that we're giving to the control group, we call that a placebo. It's something that is identical to the treatment group, but contains no active ingredient. You might have heard of that before. So let's recap some major ideas here. Random assignment. It removes the potential for confounding variables. Blocking uses extraneous variables to create groups or blocks that are similar and then all treatments are then tried in each block. And then direct control. It holds extraneous variables constant so their effects are not confounding with the treatments. 